Well, thank you for including me in this session. I always enjoy talking about sphingolipids and I have had uh, some good introductions to a few of the things that we're going to say. I also want to point out that there are four main things I'm going to be talking about. What are sphingolipids as a general introduction for anyone to follow? But then to follow that up with another important point of this is why should you care about sphingolipids? Uh, part of it is to give a summary of what some of their biological functions are and diseases associated with them, uh, but otherwise to uh, justify what then I'm going to come to in the sections three and four, which are pretty deep discussions of structural variation, steps of metabolic pathways, et cetera, because it is such a complex class. And I'm hoping that uh, having had your uh, interest uh, titillated by seeing how many things they're involved in that uh, will encourage you to bear with me as we go through what, what might otherwise seem as very esoteric uh, details. I should also point out that there are other tools on the Lipid Maps website to help you with this. One was an introductory tutorial prepared by Ed Dennis. And then there have been three webinars uh, on the, uh, by Lipid Maps on basic sphingolipidology, analytical methods, and one that you may find very helpful, one on the discussion of approaches for interpretation of data from sphingolipid analyses, where I enlisted the assistance of Chiara Libero and Yusuf Hanoun to talk about how does somebody think about uh, this family of molecules and what are some of the issues associated with the data that you've gotten. So to remind ourselves about what this family of molecules are from what you just heard, they're built on a so-called sphingoid-based backbone that many people refer to as sphingosine because that was the first one that was reported, a molecule of 18 carbon atoms, a hydroxyl at the one position, amino at the two position, hydroxyl at the three, with a stereochemistry that you see here. There are other variations on that that we'll go into later on. These are often elaborated by addition of a uh, amide-linked fatty acid, uh, one example shown here for palmitic acid, to make a molecule called ceramide. Ceramide literally is supposed to be a sphingosine-containing uh, sphingolipid, uh, because if it has a different backbone that's saturated, for example, it would be referred to as a dihydroceramide. But one often also sees ceramide used colloquially to include all of the acylated species. So you have to dig a little bit deeper as you see uh, names being applied to find out what the person's really referring to. There's a wide spectrum of head groups that are found on the sphingolipids, starting from the classically thought of ones, which are the phosphosphingolipids, ceramide, phosphocholine, sphingomyelin is the one that immediately comes to everyone's mind, but also there are phosphoethanolamines in mammalian tissues, ceramide 1-phosphate, and a number of other species, but mainly you find the other species in other organisms. Also, the major category that we think about are the glycosphingolipids, where one has the carboxyl group attached directly to the hydroxyl built on two families, the glucosyl version where you first have a glucose attached to the galactosyl family for galactose, which can each be elaborated to more complex uh, sphingolipids. And then there are the lyso versions of these, which generically means you don't have an amide-linked fatty acid. Fairly recently, it's been found that there are also sphingolipids that have a fatty acid at the first hydroxyl group, uh, where the head group would otherwise be. And they're very interesting because they show up in lipid droplets and things of that sort. Um, those are often not seen in uh, sphingolipid analyses because often samples have been treated with base to eliminate the glycerol lipids that interfere with analysis. So to assess that family, one has to use special procedures. As an example for the glycosphingolipid family of how uh, this generally works when you have the ceramide backbone the sugars are elaborated and uh, typically abbreviated by a nomenclature that we'll come to later on that has both uh, direct letters associated with it, like the GLC for glucose and GAL, uh, but as well uh, shape and color 
which we'll, you'll see a little later, will, is a very nice uh, simplifying approach for nomenclature. These families are overlaid uh, in the lipid maps website with a classification system that uh, is fairly comprehensive in being able to uh, cover the mammalian species as well as species found in other organisms. For example, the arseno, uh, uh, where arsenate replaces the phosphate group found in some aquatic organisms. A question that often comes in nomenclature is, uh, why do they have the strange name Sphingo? And for those of you that haven't heard this story before, it's because the discoverer of the Sphingo lipids, G.O.W. Tudicum, writes in his initial description of uh, the uh, Sphingosin, as he spells it here, that in commemoration of the many enigmas which he presented to the inquirer, he's given the name of Sphingosin, i.e. relating it back to the enig enigma of the Sphinx. And it's interesting, I'll give you a bibliography of here of different places where he refers to that, each of which are uh, fascinating reads to see how we came uh, to uh, uh, characterize this molecule uh, as a unique uh, species. The actual uh, uh, description of its precise chemical structure came much later in the 1940s with Herb Carter, but Herb Carter not only uh, determined its structure rigorously, but also um, made the proposal that families of compounds that have sphingosine or sphingoid bases as the backbone should be called sphingolipids. The uh, interest in sphingolipids, i.e. why you should care about it, ranges from their importance for the biophysical uh, properties of membranes. Often people refer to this in the uh, angle of uh, the formation of lipid rafts or microdomains where uh, sphingolipids tend to self-associate and interact with other lipids such as cholesterol, but also they have important effects on membranes for uh, charge. If you uh, consider the gangliosides and sulfatides that have uh, negative charge and the relatively saturated nature of the sphingoid base and fatty acid backbones, which can have a solidifying effect in addition to the segregation in the microdomains. So there are elements of these molecules that are important for their biophysical properties. But what one more generally thinks about these days are the sphingolipids and their roles in cell signaling, as summarized here for the molecules that come to mind first for that, uh, ceramide, uh, sphingosine 1-phosphate, and sphingosine, because they were mapped out earliest and have been summarized in uh, elegant detail in these two reviews by Yusuf Anun and Lena Obeid. Uh, and the multiple types of uh, ways that this uh, sph sphingolipid signaling pathway can be activated or illustrated on this slide from that review. And I can't go into that in further detail here, but uh, I have put a fair number of uh, references in this presentation because the, there are many topics I'll only be able to touch on like this, but with the bibliography, you'd be able to get into it uh, on your own if you want to follow up. As you can see, though, from this one, that in addition to the many things that trigger these metabolic processes, the break over down the sphingomyelin to ceramide and on, so on, are senescence, differentiation, apoptosis, cell cycle uh, control. Uh, it's it's a, at the heart of a lot of biological and biochemical processes. And a new addition to that, uh, new meaning a few decades past, back, but was ceramide 1-phosphate, which has important roles in cell proliferation, migration, and survival. And I give a bibliography for that here. And even more recent than that, a molecule that's not very well characterized, ceramide 1,3-cyclic phosphate, a species that formed from sphingomyelinase Ds that are produced uh, by uh, venomous spiders, like the brown recluse spider where it's found in the venom, but a number of also necrotic uh, bacteria and uh, fungi. The lyso uh, sphingolipids uh, that most come to mind are lysosphingomyelins and lysoglycosphingolipids, in this case specifically galactosyl sphingosine cycosine because it's been found to be elevated in some uh, hereditary diseases of uh, glycosphingolipid metabolism. And these molecules are also 
uh, highly bioactive, and it's argued that sphingosine phosphorylcholine is also likely to be a signaling molecule based on its apparent effects as it as it would be a sync. Uh, as if it would be a second messenger and its ability to affect some families of cell surface receptors. Uh, my screen's not advancing, there we go. And then if we move on to the glycosphingal lipids, a review by Rick Proia uh, in a very nice manner reviews the types of physiology and pathophysiology that are associated with these as this ring indicates that in um, multiple organs and multiple biological processes, um, key players in this pathway of performing essential functions. And one fairly quickly segues from that the specific subcategories such as gangliosides, which are important in regulation of uh, structure of the alpha outer leaflet of plasma membrane, but also to serve as cell surface receptors for proteins found on neighboring membranes, as you see in the diagram on the right from a review by Ron Snarr, as modulators of receptor tyrosine kinases and participants in a proteinopathy such as Alzheimer's disease. And in a fairly analogous way, sulfatides are involved in uh, uh, binding proteins to the surface of cells uh, very important in the myelin sheath, but also in essentially all tissues of the body, and even are engaged in uh, processes such as the uh, recognition of uh, uh, surfaces by macrophages through scavenger receptors. They are also important for the number of diseases that are have been associated with sphingolipid metabolism. Most classically, these were in, in uh, born errors of sphingolipid metabolism. The ones that were first discovered were the diseases of uh, sphingolipid turnover, such as Neiman Pick's disease, Gauguin's disease, et cetera. But in recent years, in addition to expansion of understanding that side of the pathway, there are now, uh, I think, uh, diseases associated with genetic defects in uh, every uh, step of uh, de novo sphingolipid biosynthesis as well. So it's a family of uh, molecules that are uh, intimately linked to uh, diseases of, uh, due to inborn errors of metabolism, but as well to the other diseases that one uh, can get uh, outside of inherited, uh, from cancer, to cardiovascular disease, uh, inflammation, including uh, effects on GI tract via uh, glycosphingolipids uh, in the GI microflora, uh, NASH, Parkinson's disease, cystic fibrosis, viral, bacterial, fungal, parasitic infections, and in the virus category, even uh, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, and to move it into a direction we don't normally think about in lipid metabolism, uh, intriguing work uh, from Richard Kolesnik about the role of sphingolipids in the uh, damage to the GI tract from uh, high energy radiation that his laboratory is moving towards uh, the possible development of uh, a, a way to uh, protect the body if they are accidentally exposed or viciously exposed to a gamma radiation. So I hope that that spectrum uh, has convinced you that it's a family of molecules that are worth investing the time to uh, figure out um, as much as you can about if we now drill back then in more detail about how they um, are more structurally diverse, if we look at the uh, backbone, a standard nomenclature for it is to beyond the one that you've just heard about, but the one that you'll see mostly in the literature because it's historic, are that they will be defined by the chain number, like 18 carbon atoms, the number of double bonds, if known, the stereochemistry like 4E for sphingosine, a, a, a number that indicates the number of hydroxyl groups, so D for the dihydroxy uh, species of uh, a standard ceramide, or for the species that would have a hydroxyl group here that you team referred to earlier, but wouldn't have the double bond that would just, excuse me, have the hydroxyl here, it, then that would be a, a, a T for a trihydroxy version or often referred to as phyto 
sphingosine. This diagram then expands those into structures. And although you don't have time to look at all of them, I'll bring your attention to some specific points about it. One is that the alkyl chain link can vary mostly in mammals from 16 to 20 carbon atoms. They can be unsaturated, which would be the sphingonine family, or unsaturated at the four or five position, which is what you typically refer to as the sphingosines or sphingonines or sphingonine. A, major, a fairly large amount of this diene is also found with the 4E, 14Z double bond, and we'll talk about that later. And then a hydroxy species uh, hydroxylated here, as well as the, the so-called phyto version where you have the hydroxyl group at the uh, four position uh, found in skin. And an intriguing, uh, that would be the phyto over here, intriguing family of molecules relatively recently discovered where the hydroxyl group is missing from the one position and even the hydroxymethyl group is missing, the so-called deoxy sphingolipids. Fatty acyls usually range from four to 20, four, 26 carbons, except in the skin where you can have it much longer. They're often saturated or monounsaturated. And uh, one will often find an alpha hydroxy group on the fatty acid and particularly for the skin, uh, sphingolipids and omega hydroxy group. And as we start going into the head groups now, then you start seeing a, a huge amount of diversity which can be symbolized, as I indicated, by symbols for the sugars so that you don't have to draw out all the uh, complicated structures, even not standardized, but one can conveniently uh, pick your own. If you want to do a diagram for the choline, I elected to use a black dot because it wasn't being used elsewise. Um, and that this indicates to you that these will then start being subdivided into other specific categories, for example, a globo family polysaccharide is one that literally has a beta linked glucose and then beta linked glucosamine, alpha linked glucosamine, and or, excuse me, beta linked galactose, uh, alpha linked galactose, and then beta linked uh, galactosamine, the square meaning uh, the amine rather than the uh, standard sugar. And then that this go uses that nomenclature to show what it would look like for the ganglia site I referred to earlier. This diagram that we prepared a number of years ago gives you a hint of what uh, appears to be the structural variation in uh, mammalian sphingolipids, indicating the families of head groups. And there are other tools that are developing uh, better ways of dealing with this information. This was just for convenience of getting an idea about what it looks like all in one place. The lysosphingolipids, I've already indicated, some are made from the glycan, but the one we think of a lot these days is sphingosine 1-phosphate because of its role in signaling. So that's a overview of the structures in more detail. Let's now turn our attention to where they come from. Sphingolipid biosynthesis de novo, begins from the condensation of serine with the fatty acyl-CoA for the 18-carbon sphingosine that uh, fatty acid would be a palmitoyl-CoA by a pyridoxal phosphate-dependent enzyme serine palmitoyl transferase. It's a decarboxylation of the, fat, of the fatty acyl-CoA, excuse me, a decarboxylation of the serine, I'm sorry, the pyridoxal phosphate-dependent decarboxylation of the serine to form the bond with the fatty acyl CoA by displacement of the CoA moiety that gives you this a keto intermediate that is usually rapidly reduced by reductase. Then the intermediate sphingenine, the fully saturated sphingoid base, is acylated by a family of ceramide synthases. And then the, that so called dihydroceramide is, uh, can be desaturated or hydroxylated if desaturated to make sphingosine as the backbone and the uh, N-acyl sphingosine. The dihydroceramides or ceramides can both uh, proceed to head group addition. So by that scheme, wh where do the other uh, sphingoid bases come from? Well, but for variation of the uh, fatty acid chain link, it's a combination of 
what fatty acids are available. So serine palmitoyl oil transferase has a preference for uh, historically for 18 carbons, but will also accommodate less well uh, 17, 16 carbon atoms. So some amount of structural variability can come from that. But uh, more importantly, have been the re relatively recent discoveries that there are isoforms of serine palmitoyl oil transferase where the subunits are, are, are associated proteins are varied and that those subunits have different fatty aso coa selectivities. So that's a major determinant of control of the alkyl chain length that you find in the sphingoid-based backbone. Another important uh, regulation is of the which uh, amino acid is used. It turns out serine palmitoyl oil transferase is a fairly promiscuous enzyme and will accommodate serine preferentially over alanine, preferentially over glycine, but even that uh, varies somewhat based on the SBT isoform. But it's very sensitive to the relative amounts of these three substrates. So when you have uh, physiological circumstances where alanine is present in uh, high levels over serine, then you can get a substantial amount of the deoxy molecules being formed. So the levels of regulation of this pathway involve the availability and types of the substrates, the uh, subspecies of the serine palmitoyl oil transferase, and then a relatively recently found pathway is the involvement of the ORM family proteins in regulating a flux a through serine palmitoyl oil transferase, ORM family proteins being inhibitors. A very useful uh, inhibitor of serine palmitoyl oil transferase, by the way, is a molecule called myriosin. For the acylation, it's via the, I mentioned the ceramide synthesis. And again, that gives you a clue to uh, what types of fatty acids are going to be added, because you see here in this bar, the different subfamilies have different fatty acyl-CoA selectivities. So one can get some very uh, useful information when you uh, look at the gene expression profile for a particular tissue as to the likely uh, pr profile of the chain links of the ceramides from looking at that. An important uh, molecule has been found in this family is are the fumonosins, which are both substrates and inhibitors of serine palmitoyl oil transferase. And findings with the fumonosins have indicated an important point in sphingolipid metabolism in general, which is that when you perturb one step with something, for example, inhibiting uh, the ceramide synthesis with fumonosins, that elevates or suppresses a large number of other highly bioactive species. And as a result of changes in multiple sphingolipid bioactive species that have multiple uh, intracellular targets that they can perturb, then you can have a very uh, complex uh, set of uh, physiologic uh, abnormalities then that have the uh, toxicological uh, consequences of that. Uh, so with just this one environmental contaminant that's known to cause uh, diseases of humans and other animals, um, you get a, a hint about the complexity of trying to understand uh, what goes on anytime in this pathway when even just one thing you think has been perturbed in the way it impacts everything else around it. Introduction of the double bonds uh, occurs through uh, at the four uh, position, a, a so-called DES1, DES2, with DES2 uh, also being a, a four hydroxylase. So it's the uh, desaturase that's responsible for addition of the uh, hydroxyl group for the phytosphingoid base family. And interestingly, DES1 has been found to be a uh, metabolizer of uh, retinoic uh, retinols, which is intriguing in the visual system. Also, it's interesting that there are families of DES uh, compounds that will be in DES inhibitors and phenolic compounds in general uh, tend to affect DES, not just by directly inhibiting the enzyme, but also in some cases by uh, stimulating its degradation. As Nigel Pine, uh, his wife, have been looking at uh, recently. They, uh, also, it's very important that there are biochemical and physiological uh, consequences of uh, death inhibition or suppression of death activity by other means. It's only recently been found how the double bond for the sphingodiene family 
is introduced, and that's by an uh, enzyme BADS S3, previously thought to be involved uh, in fatty acid desaturation, but also at least uh, is now the gene responsible for addition of that uh, double bond and an uh, interesting story evolving about that. So that gets you through the steps of biosynthesis of the lipid part. Now, as you start to add the head groups, that's a, a interesting and uh, story in its own uh, realm. For sphingomyelin synthesis, for example, there are three different uh, families of sphingomyelin synthases in mammals. One SMS1 located in the Golgi, so it receives the ceramide very proximal to the initial synthesis of the ceramide in the endoplasmic reticulum. But another SMS2 that's in the plasma membrane and involved for ceramide is either traffic there or ceramide liberated in the plasma membrane by the uh, turnover and the signaling. Uh, it's also located in other places in the cell. And then the SMSR, which is interesting because SMSR is not just a sphingomyelin a synthase, but it also is able to make ceramide phosphoethanolamine with PE as a donor. The reaction for sphingomyelin synthesis being a trans uh, sterification from phosphatidylcholine to the uh, ceramide backbone release of diisoglycerol. For the glycosphingolipids, then we are in the business of uh, uh, glycosyl transferases being involved. So the, to add the glucose group, it'll be a glucosyl ceramide synthase for the galactosyl. Uh, galactosyl ceramide synthase, as I notice here, uh, forms and abbreviations and lo subcellular localizations, which is interesting, especially with galactosyl ceramide being made in the ER lumen. And in some work that we've done but haven't published, it appears that when you have processes happen, such as ER stress, where a ceramide hangs around in the ER uh, longer than it normally might, therefore has a chance to flip to the ER lumen, there's apparently increases in galactosyl ceramides being biosynthesized. Or the missing family that I haven't talked about, ceramide phosphate, that's formed through a um, kinase, ceramide kinase. So localization is important. And in addition to localization of the enzymes that do these processes being important, we also need to think about what implications that has for trafficking. The trafficking of these intermediates from the ER to the Golgi as part of vesicles for the vesicular mechanism, but also there are families of proteins important in that process, like the ceramide transport protein uh, discovered by Ken and and characterized uh, as having fascinating uh, properties and functions of its own, and as well, uh, glycolipid transport proteins that have been found by other laboratories and play roles in moving these families of molecules around. There's not time to talk about the details of the, um, all the other steps that are involved in making these molecules uh, in the complex sphingolipid family, but I think it is worth uh, pausing for a moment to say that it's not as overwhelming as it might seem. This was the central core that I spoke to you before about how ceramide can go into glucosyl ceramides or galactosyl ceramides. And once the galactosyl ceramide is made, it's a fairly well-defined family of enzymes that are able to add either another galactose or a sialic acid or sulfate to make the sulfatides. So that arm is relatively simple to think about. In the case of the bigger group, the ones that are based on lactosyl ceramide, where you first add a galactose and beta-4 linkage to the, the glucose, that branches off into, as I say, potentially hundreds of molecules. But in the major families that we talked about in the root structures before, so if one is going to go, for example, to the lacto root, you first add a, a, a uh, an acetyl glucosamine, and then one can add a galactose uh, to be able to get into the, uh, in the beta-3 position to get into the so-called uh, LC family or the lacto family, or 
in the beta-4 linkage for the neolacto family. Similarly, you could trace through the uh, uh, ganglio family, the globo family, or the isoglobo, uh, isoglobo not uh, found in uh, humans, but uh, important in mammals. So the glycobiology is a, uh, a, a field that is complicated, but one where it can be broken down into uh, discernible pieces. And when you see gene expression profiles change, you can make predictions or conversely, when you see metabolites change, you can start understanding what is happening uh, preceding that. A complication in this pathway, which is often referred to as the, its involvement of combinatorial synthesis has been uh, referred to mostly for the ganglioside in the sense that as a molecule comes down the pathway, because there are multiple options for where they can go, then based on what you set the system up as to the relative levels of activities or trafficking that's going to take place with these molecules, will decide which ultimate more complex a series will be formed. Turnover, a major focus of uh, sphingolipid metabolism because of the many diseases that have historically been associated with it is conceptually uh, simple, involving specific uh, hydrolases that can cleave uh, uh, particular uh, functional groups so that you can have ways that certain sugars are removed, ways that sulfates are removed, ways, et cetera, ways the phosphocholine head groups are removed. So these genes have been characterized and uh, worked out fairly well. Uh, and interestingly, uh, the integration of that now with the hydrolases that are involved in signaling has made a very uh, 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 nice uh, way of connecting some of the uh, pathologies that are, have been associated with the sphingolipid uh, storage diseases, as well as having a easy, easier path and understanding some of the signaling processes. This gives a, a, a hint about that uh, because of the importance of the subcellular localization in it and the way I've talked about the ceramide moiety initially being made in the ER some processes involving trafficking to the Golgi, sometimes to other locations uh, in the cell. And as the glycosyl transferases uh, also have subcellular, specific subcellular localizations, uh, that will uh, influence uh, what uh, can be made, uh, even the, uh, depending on what uh, portion of the Golgi stacks a particular uh, ensemble of enzymes are found. Then as they track, excuse me, as they traffic out of the, uh, I have to go back to that, as they traffic out of, the, I'm sorry, I'm pushing the wrong button. As they traffic out of the uh, trans-Golgi, uh, what their target will be uh, in the plasma membrane or for those that are going to be uh, heading directly to the lysosome. And then uh, the process is involved in uh, endocytosis and uh, turning over of the sphingolipids. The, Turnover, uh, in some cases, generates sphingosine that will be degraded, but in other cases, sphingosine that will be recycled so that we end up with a process that has uh, a fairly important uh, salvage uh, component. And Yusuf Anun has been giving uh, quite a bit of attention to that uh, lately, and it is an important uh, element uh, to this. So with the uh, tremendous amount of uh, new findings about how the lysosome is structured and operates. For example, work that Conrad Sandoff has uh, talked about on many occasions about the uh, accessory proteins to facilitate that, the efflux transporters uh, that people like Francis Platt have been characterizing, and then the ways that the molecules as they come into the cytosol and can be uh, turned over or activated into signaling molecules decide that, uh, say it's Sarah Spiegel, talks about, you see, it's a, a very importantly integrated uh, process. So the subcellular localization of how these things happen are going to be uh, very important about what happens uh, metabolically, but also where the functions are taking place and how the functions are being modulated. And getting a handle on that is one of the greatest challenge of, of sphingolipidomics going forward. And luckily there are some tools, some 
photoactivatable analogs and click tools uh, that are uh, likely to be key to getting into that uh, aspect. Imaging is able to get to the nanoscale, that, that, as in some cases it can, but uh, not generally applicable, then that obviously will be a, a player too. But of course, anytime that you have something with a, a great challenge, uh, great challenges are also uh, great opportunities. And this is a field where a lot still remains to be done. So any young person that might be listening to this presentation and thinking, wow, there's so much going on and so much is known, uh, maybe there's no room for anything else or so, nobody else to come into it. It's exactly the opposite. The core foundation is now there. Um, a lot of tools are evolving and a very, very, very small fraction of what is going on with sphingolipids is currently known. And most of what sphingolipids are involved in uh, remains to be discovered at the most basic level. Connected to that, the links to disease and the capitalization of that was sphingolipid-based therapeutics. Obviously, some has begun going back to enzyme replacement uh, for Gaucher's disease, um, but, and now more recently, drugs that are based on sphingolipids, FDY720 for modulating sphingos one phosphate and its receptors, et cetera. So there's, there has, a, the paradigm has been proven, uh, but very little, of the um, many things that could possibly be done have yet been finished. And uh, as well as all of that in the classic way we think of uh, biochemistry and biomedical sciences, there's a third uh, critical element, which is to think about the link between this and the sphingolipids that are brought into your body exogenously, uh, one major source being as components of food since sphingolipids are found in high amounts by food. A number of years ago, my laboratory did an estimation of it. And it, you, every year you consume several hundred grams of sphingolipids in your diet. So it's not a trivial amount of molecules that your body deals with. A fair amount that it degrades and throws away, but a certain amount that uh, is reused. And I give two uh, reviews of this, including one from a former postdoc in my lab regarding dietary one deoxy sphingolipids, um, so that even molecules that are seen as intermediates of uh, uh, toxicities, uh, when generated aberrantly, physiologically neurotoxicities, um, also intermediates for fumonisin uh, toxicity. Um, these are also components of the diet, and nobody knows uh, what their uh, effects might be. So I want to thank you for participating in this session uh, and wanting to learn about these sorts of uh, topics. I also want to thank uh, Lipid Maps and the, uh, its coordinators and maintainers of the websites and so forth tools because those have been instrumental in uh, helping spread the word about how these complex molecules uh, are a field that warrants study by more people. Also, I should point out that there's a group called the Sphingolipid Biology Team that conducts a periodic uh, talks and webinars and uh, is also um, coordinating a conference next week. On, uh, uh, and another a third, an additional group called the Sphingolipid Club that was initiated in Europe, uh, but is international that you can connect to to be part of this uh, bigger, bigger feel, but also to keep up with the literature by following what's being done. So I also lastly want to thank the uh, people that have been, assisted me in the background of what I've done in this field and my laboratory or as collaborators.